Thank you for joining us for this 20th episode of the Calcedon podcast. Today is November 21st, 2021, and we're going to discuss the meaning of the words liberty and freedom. Now, who would have ever thought we would have lived in a day where certain words that would be obvious, like male and female, would be questioned? But the problem is when we don't get our definitions from scripture. And so there are many scripture references to liberty. What's on the Liberty Bell, proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. Are there places where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And of course, if the sun shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. But I'm not sure today many Christians could adequately or correctly define liberty and freedom from a biblical perspective. So we'll start with you, Mark. Are liberty and freedom the same thing? Do they mean the same thing? Or is there a difference? Well, the words have differing origins, obviously, but you can trace the root words uh, behind words, and then separately there's a, a development of meaning. Usually in, in our lifetimes and, and in recent history, they've been used interchangeably, even though over the centuries they've had uh, finer shades of, of meaning. And reference, but the, the the larger question is, how do you understand them? Uh, most people would say these are important concepts, but how do you define these, and and what's your standard for defining what liberty and freedom actually are? Well, Martin, Dr. Rushduni has always made a point of connecting law and liberty. And he gets that from the book of James, I'm sure, where we talk, where the scripture talks about the perfect law of liberty. So is can liberty be defined or explained if you divide it apart from God's word? Well, there's no doubt that David connected the two and felt that they were inseparable from each other. Uh, this is clear in Psalm 119. And if I recall the correct quotation here. Very brief, but he says, and the whole verse is this, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. You see, the only reason that David walks at liberty is because he seeks God's precepts. He ties the law of God to liberty. The Hebrew seems to indicate I will walk in a, in a wide space. In other words, very few restrictions. A very wide space is open to me to, to freely walk because I seek God's precepts. Now, when you abandon God's precepts, Liberty no longer exists. You become constrained. It's a narrow space. You're straightened, as they say in uh, biblical language. You are stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place. That's the battle between the one and the many. In fact, that's the battle between the rock and the hard place. So on David's own counsel, on the one psalm that deals with the law of God, specifically for all 176 verses, we have it on God's own authority. That seeking God's precepts, putting the law of God first, walking therein, that is the key to liberty. And when you lose the key, you are locked out of liberty. You have something else. You might have libertinism and license and anarchism and violence and collapse of social structures and your culture, but you will not have liberty because there is no balance because God's precepts are set aside. So the precondition for liberty is God's law. And uh, that is why James is not saying anything really new. It is the perfect law of liberty because it's the only thing that obtains liberty for us. Now, people try to run aground on the question of law versus grace. That's why it's very useful to us to see that almost adjacent to this verse, David says, graciously give us thy law. So he connects grace and law in one verse, liberty and law in the adjacent verse. And there's a reason for that is because this unity of these things, they are harmonious with one another. It's man who sets these things at variance and claims that law is opposed to liberty. Humanism does that because humanism has already, already proposed as a false god, man, and this false god wants to be a tyrant, and therefore the only restraint against him is God's law, and he flings it away, attacks it, and demonizes it. As a consequence, he promises to liberate you, 
And every liberation movement in the 20th century certainly has done nothing but enslave people. So that's an interesting point. Humanism yeah. says man is the standard, but under humanism, tyrannies develop because some men are more intelligent and smarter than other men, kind of like George Orwell's animal house, I mean, animal farm, in terms of that somebody's going to put themselves at the top. So comment on something you said. You said law gives us a white space, but we're told to stay on the straight path. Is there a contradiction there? No, the straight path is the path that leads to life. When you fall off that path, that is when bad things happen, and that's when your liberty is curtailed. Uh, we don't seem to recognize this. Uh, we associate the uh, wide, uh, easy path, at least to destruction, as the, 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 the one full of liberty. Well, it's, it's, it's a liberty to destruction. You know, uh, God says, I can proclaim liberty to the plague and to the sword to you. This is actually language found in Isaiah. I will proclaim you know, uh, a festival, if you will, or a Sabbath to these things, a, a liberty to these things. If you want liberty from the sword, then, of course, you follow what Leviticus tells us to do, which is to honor God's law. And then the sword will not pass through your land. The second you abandon God's law, then the sword comes through your land. Uh, and that is, is a metaphor there for something that's uh, evil and tyrannizing, and it uh, tears human society apart because it's founded on a false premise that it cannot make good upon. I did an article, Dialectic Culture, which says that every single state and every single culture is an experiment to see how can we balance the one and the many. And everyone that abandons biblical truth, the nature of the Trinity and God's law, ends up in a tyrannical form. Either too much one, too much of the many, but out of balance because man has no other options when he moves God out of the picture. So, Mark, when, you know, these two extremes where we have thorough totalitarianism or we have anarchy, where a lot of people today are saying it would be better if we had no state telling us what to do. That's not biblical, is it? No, not at all, because man is always an, a creature, so he's always under authority, and ultimately he's always under God's authority. And God has placed authority, and authority is 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 important. But you're right in calling the, the, the attention to the fact that man varies between anarchy and, and statism, because when man rebels against God, Man doesn't have one method of rebellion, rebellion because man can't be consistent. He's basically running away from God, so he's running in, in many different directions. And so the extremes of man's forms of rebellion shouldn't surprise us. Who, who's the authority now if you're rebelling against God? Is it the individual? Well, that leads you to a position of anarchy. Nobody can tell me what to do. Nobody should be have, have any say over me. Uh, I should be a law unto myself. On the other hand, if you believe that there must be some form of authority over you, some human uh, authority, then inevitably you end up, as my father repeated over and over again, you end up with some form of statism because the state will always claim to represent collective man. And the voice will say, you know, we are the highest collective voice of the of individuals and therefore we represent the people in some regard or in some way and so the state has often seen itself as the embodiment of the people or representative of the people in more recent uh, uh, western nations but it it is the popular will is is often been used in recent uh, centuries as a means of totalitarian control and of course, the popular will, how do you know what that is? Oftentimes, people will resort to what they'll see or hear on mainstream media, and they'll decide that's what the popular will is when it may just be the channeled or filtered will of certain people. Certainly. So, yeah. Yes, you see that uh, very often in, in, in uh, political organizations and political statements when 
they like a particular, let's say an electoral result, they, they like a particular electoral result, they'll say the people have spoken. In other words, this gives us more authority to do what we wanted to do anyway, because we really know best. And if they do not like something, they feel that the people have repudiated something, then they often will ignore that because they'll say, but it's our obligation to lead the people. And I, I've seen that a number of times over the years. So, Martin, when people basically embrace liberty or think they embrace liberty, a lot of times they don't want it when they realize that responsibility follows. Yeah, that is the problem, is that uh, people don't want tyranny, but they want responsibility even less. Dr. Rushton made this point repeatedly, and human history is this lesson writ large across the pages of the calendar. Every year, we have more and more evidence that people refuse responsibility, and therefore, liberty goes out the door. Because the Bible certainly makes man responsible to God first and to his fellow man second, and it does so in an irrevocable, inexorable way, because then God puts his sanctions upon it. It's not the state that you should fear in a Christian situation. It's God that you should fear. This, you know, it's not that this is, the state is creating a problem that people yell, hey, mountains and, and uh, rocks come down and fall on me. That's not because of the state creating uh, grief for you. That's because you recognize you're dealing with the wrath of the lamb. <laughs> so we should get our categories straight on this. I have a comment also about this tendency toward anarchism. Having had discussions with folks uh, that attempt to be consistent and saying there really should be no king but Christ, uh, and that means no government except man under God, under the Jesus, through the Bible. This runs aground on the Bible itself. Now, people say, well, you certainly put a lot on this uh, head tax in Exodus 30, but we don't rest our case on that. Though it's an important point that half shekel of silver for every male head of household 20 years or up is to be paid to fund civil government. And this was repeated in the restoration under Nehemiah. And the fish that Jesus instructed Peter to catch was to pay that tax for Peter and for Jesus. So a miracle was involved to make sure that that tax was paid, even though Jesus was technically free of paying it. He was supposed to be paid to him, not by him. Nonetheless, it stands, and that is a measure of the size, very small size of biblical government, but it's there. But there are those who would say even that should be abandoned. And to them, I have to say this. In Isaiah 32, we get a picture of a messianic state. What it looks like, that is the messianic Jesus' rule as a messiah over the nations. And it says there that the king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule with justice. And there it is laid out. There is the king, Christ. If it's not him, it's some very, very, very good king who's righteous. And there's the princes. They're mentioned there as part of the package. And then the very second verse is talking about men as a consequence, being responsible to their fellow men by being a refuge and a covert and uh, a shelter and a shade for those who are in trouble, who are, who are weak, who are thirsty, who are hungry, who are needy, who are oppressed. So one of the functions of the state is to lift oppression. But there is a state there. In fact, for those who say, well, what about tax collection? That gets even more interesting. There's a verse in Isaiah 60, also talking about the Messianic era, which we're living in now. For brass, I will bring gold, and for iron, I will bring silver, and for wood, brass, and for stones, iron. I, and this is God talking. I will make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. Now, that's interesting. The officers of the land are peace. They're the source of peace. They're the source of liberty and freedom. And thy exactors, those who collect the tax, the tithes, and things like this, are also righteousness. So there's nothing intrinsically evil about it. In fact, they're upheld as God's standard. So they're there. The function is defined in Scripture and is extremely limited. It's nothing like the modern humanistic state. But there is a state, and it is a God-honoring state. It's a righteous state. It's a just state. It's a peaceful state. And it is under God. So the anarchists have to try to blow this apart. One of the ways they try to do this, and I've had this discussion on Facebook, someone said, show me in the law of God, that is 
restricted to Exodus through Deuteronomy, where you have princes and kings and things like this. And his conclusion was, apart from Deuteronomy 17, he says there aren't any there. They only have judges. That's his conclusion. Then he, he signed off the conversation. I, I beat you with this one statement. There are only judges. Well, his position is no different than that of the woman at the well. The Samaritan position was, we don't need anything past Deuteronomy. We just need Genesis to Deuteronomy. And that's why we're worshiping here on Mount Gerizim, because there's no better place to do it, uh, based on the fact that we know nothing about a Jerusalem being spoken of in this passage of Scripture. So when you cut your Bible down, sure, you can make all sorts of claims. But when you use the whole counsel of God, you then you have to take into account passages that support a Christian state. But this is a microscopic state. The entire funding for America is under $600 million for all forms of government. We're 11,000 times bigger than that. So the Christian notion of the state emphasizes a libertarian ethos because it is so tiny and it's restricted to execution of judgment. That is righteousness. That's God's law. And that is its limitation. It doesn't educate. It's not involved in health, except for the Levitical functions, which is not what the state's supposed to do. It's only involved in justice, and it's justice as defined by God's law, not by humanistic law. It's been well commented, Gary North said it, that the law of God is a very small set of 613 commandments, most of which involve the temple that no longer exists, most of which are also enforced by God himself, not by man. But man's law, like the Congregational Register, goes into morning and evening editions. It just expands because all the alphabet uh, agencies, the supervisorial capacity of the government to grow uh, and metastasize is unlimited because man wants to be God and therefore he seeks no limits on the word of man. And that means to silence and muzzle the law of God. And this, of course, spells the doom for our nation if we persist in going down this path. Right. You know, Dr. Rostini always emphasized that the law gives liberty and freedom, but that God has outlined the law in terms of negatives, thou shalt not. Um, Just recently, I heard the leader of our country say, this isn't about freedom, this is about us protecting you. And I wonder how many people had a bell go off that says, wait a minute, your job is not to protect us, your job in civil government is justice and defense. So when you decide that I need your help and I must take it whether or not I want it, Mark, aren't there then this overreach because people don't understand that a positive expression Mm -hmm. of the law will give status unlimited jurisdiction? Positive view of law, in fact, it's called positive law, absolutely does give the state an open-ended mandate to do whatever they perceive as necessary. And you're right, my father often, as have others, observed that that God's law is largely negative law because it puts moral boundaries against certain actions. It's largely what man is precluded from doing, lest he commit the first, uh, repeat the first sin of trying to be as God knowing or determining good and evil for himself. And so God gives us the law, and then God specifically precludes us from certain actions lest we uh, trample that. And so, yes, the, the, the negative aspect of God's law is not a, something that which we, we should see as a, a vast realm of limitation, but it actually means that... Uh, if you stay away from those areas God has specifically forbidden, you have a vast realm of liberty. You have a vast realm of freedom. You see, it's like God is, is saying uh, to a fish, you live in water, and you can't live without water. There are certain boundaries you're made for in my order of things, and a fish isn't freer out of the water. And you, it's obvious from our culture that a lot of people are trying to be uh, to, to swim outside of the water in which God placed them. So this is go on, Martin. Go yeah, on. This is a good example of that is the Garden of Eden. There was every tree, every, every tree except one was allowed to man. That was how much liberty and freedom man had. 
was you know, 99.999% of everything he wanted to do, he could do. He had to pick the 0.0001% of the trees that it was not to be eaten. And that's how he exerted his alleged freedom and liberty and brought woe to every generation thereafter. And we should talk about this notion of protection as it relates to freedom. This has been laid out already in scripture. I was just reading a sermon that John Owen preached on the occasion of the death of Oliver Cromwell. And his text was Isaiah 4, 5. I've spoken about it before. And the text ends, upon all the glory shall be a defense. That is, where God is glorified, there is a protection. There is a canopy, a covering, a, 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 in the literal sense is a defense. You get all the protection you need when God's glory is made first, is made the, the uh, preeminent, if you will, in your culture, in your nation, in your city, in your family. That will protect. Uh, and that's all the protection that you actually do need. You see, and as you know well, uh, when you drew attention to this, when you provoke, uh, decided this would be a good topic for us, uh, Andrea, you appealed to an essay by Dr. Rashtuni about religious liberty, about the relationship of Frederick III to Luther. And Luther saying, you know, I don't think you can protect me, but I can protect you. If you keep the church free, uh, then we are in a position to protect you. This is really riffing off of the theme of Isaiah 4, 5, upon all the glory shall be a defense. There's a protection when God's freedom and liberties are put first, when God's cause is protected. This is why Artaxerxes in Ezra 7, he says, why should there be wrath upon the king and upon his domain, upon himself and his rule over uh, the nation? And he says this in the connections of why would you dare tax the church of God? That'll bring wrath upon me and my domain. Let's not do this. In fact, let's protect and promote biblical religion instead. And that's what Artaxerxes did. And this, if you will, bought him some peace and liberty for his rest of his domain, by and large. He made the right move. And in terms of protection, it actually kind of shamed Ezra to say, I'm a, here I talked God up so big, and now I'm asking for a military contingent to, to guide us back to Jerusalem. Uh, I talk a good game, but now I'm scared. I wish I kind of hadn't, but he stood by his guns. But yeah, he uh, it became scary. He had to stand on the promises of God, but at least he left with a good witness. So there's a lot going on in Ezra 7 that we should consider for our area, day and era. There's everything going on with uh, Isaiah 4, 5, as John Owen expanded that for his nation, the English nation. And America needs to realize the exact same lesson that upon all the glory, there is a defense. And where God's glory is denied, there is no defense. Any shield you put up when God is not present is full of holes. Ask Ahab how good his armor protected him when he apostatized. Well, there was a chink in the armor, as we say. And all it took was someone taking a perchance, happenstance, arrow flight, went in between, it was a mortal wound. So there's no protection against God's arrows. And there's no protection that's any better than God's protection, but it's on his terms, not man's terms. Man wants to manufacture his own protection. We're told, as the Rashtuni points out, not to be the strong man glorying in his strength, the rich man in his riches, or the wise man in his wisdom, but in God. That means that strength, riches, wisdom are no good <laughs> as a protection. After all, God doesn't mind confounding the wisdom of the wise or the uh, strength of the strong with the weak, confounding it, setting it up, overturning everything uh, for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. That's the kingdom that will stand. So if you want to be on solid ground as opposed to shifting sand, it's not humanism that provides solid ground. It, it purports to and uses massive force to try to get there. It'll never reach it. It always collapses. Soviet Russia is proof of that. So it seems to me the question is, and it's it's been a focus of Chalcedon since the beginning, education. But I think too few people understood that it was education for everybody, not just little kids in kindergarten and grammar school. And just your references to Ezra and your references to Isaiah, how many modern Christians would know exactly what you're talking about in the way that the audience that John Owen had or others like him? So, Mark, if people are being educated in state schools, 
And if churches are being taught by people who come out of seminaries that are by and large antinomian, what's the remedy? Well, it's not an easy one, but we're largely ignorant of biblical history, the context of, of much of our faith. And we've reduced the Christian faith, the parameters of it, because it's become a very personal religion. It's become it's, uh, it's come to be seen in a dualistic sense that it's really a faith about uh, an afterlife. It's a it's a faith about higher things. We've come to have disdain about this world, and therefore we have disdain about anything we can do in the world. Therefore, our responsibilities to this world are uh, minimalized. And so we've created a type of religion. It's hardly Christianity, but it's a type of religion that's very, very foreign to the type of faith that my my father and others really have been teaching and taught about for, for many, many years and what Chalcedon has been advocated. We believe in a very full-orbed faith. One, we believe in that the kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to grow. I think historically, we would say we're in a low ebb in the church in the history of the church. And it's not going to change by some miracle. It's not going to change just because the enemy fails. We have to advance. And the only way we could advance the faith is we understand the full context of the faith, the full command of the faith and what it requires of us. And this obviously begins with the education of, of children. So, and there's academic education also in their covenant faith. I see more of that today than when I was young, uh, let's say 50, 60 years ago, certainly, but we have a long way to go. I know early in the Christian Reconstruction Movement, people who are getting into it would immediately want to say, you know, this sounds great. And they were looking forward to Christians taking over and Christians assuming responsibilities. Christians don't know what their responsibility would be in positions of cultural leadership. They don't have the background. They don't have the skills, really. So I think the whole idea of Christian reconstruction is still on the ground floor. I'm encouraged by a lot of the progress I see. It's a little chaotic because we don't we haven't been tread we haven't been treading on this ground for, for very long and we're not sure what the next step is. And sometimes that's a little confusing to people and they, they see it as, as as too disorganized. But in reality, I, I think we have occasion to uh, have some hope that that pe- more and more people, more, far more than half a century ago, are aware of the problem and are in the process of, of uh, trying to remedy that. It's going to be a long haul, though, but, but we have to understand the big picture of where the kingdom of God is, is going and what role we can play in that. And, and it's essentially, it boils down to faithfulness to the whole world, whole word of God. Right. You can add that Christians are often told when they become a Christian, you need to read the Gospel of John and probably stay in the New Testament, except maybe for a few Proverbs and Psalms. And so this direction, this push away from the Old Testament, from the kind of thing that what Timothy was raised on, which made him a fit uh, shepherd, is catastrophic. It's catastrophic because most of the material that it tells us how to walk is located in the Old Testament. And by treating it as the word of God emeritus, as expendable, as something you might start studying after you get your New Testament stuff done. And by the way, when we do this, we have very little awareness of how the two integrate. That's why it's been said by some that the best thing you can do is to take that little page between the Old and New Testament and tear it out of your Bible, because it's one unified revelation to man, and we need every jot and tittle, every word proceeds from the mouth of God, and therefore every word is important and profitable, that we might be fully equipped. And when you knife out two-thirds of the Bible and remove the 39 books of the Old Testament, 
you are not thoroughly equipped for all your words and all your concepts. So if we're if I'm pulling doctrines out of Isaiah 32, which most people are not familiar with, and saying this important passage here that deals with many, many areas that are crucial to today, and yet it's a closed word to most because we don't know what's in it. We haven't studied what the commentators have said, opening it up to us. So we had, had the benefit of guides that have gone before us to tell us, here's what God's saying in this crucial passage. And we are, it is a mystery to us. It is a stranger to our thinking. We are thinking around that, without that, in lieu of that, and in the absence of it. And that's bad because now there's holes in our theology and there are, much, there are far more holes in our theology than we can possibly imagine once we go down the path of not being aware of the importance of the whole counsel of God, which means the Old Testament must be put back in its proper place. Uh, and it needs to be put back in its proper place the fullness of its meaning for us in conjunction with the New Testament. You know, we're not saying we're just Old Testament Christians. There's no such animal. But the whole counsel of God, that makes sense. We should be walking in terms of all 66 books that God has given us. He didn't have to provide any of it, but he moved by the Holy Spirit, men to and women, I suppose, to write some of this because we have the song of uh, Hannah and uh, Mary. And those things are inscripturated. So they're there, and we need to take them seriously. We should need to take Hannah's song as seriously as we take the Magnificat, because they might come from different eras, but they're the same God. And that's the other point. When you throw the Old Testament out like that, you're kind of treating God as someone who uh, has changed his mind or evolved in some way. He's moved away from law into grace. He's going to move from grace into something else uh, later in the era of the Holy Spirit, the position of Joachim. A bit of flora, I don't recall the exact term, but this idea has been around for a while that God evolves and uh, we no longer deal with the God of the Old Testament. No, yes, you do. You very much, He is one God, He's the same God, He changes not. And that's important for us to recognize that that means the Old Testament should not be a stranger to us. You opened up this discussion with the mention of the Liberty Bell, and the Liberty Bell has engraved upon it. A passage from Leviticus, from the Jubilee Law. Uh, I think it's almost prophetic in a way that that is a cracked bell because America has paid very little attention to the source of liberty because it only comes from the law of God. And only within the law of God do we have this kind of thing. As Dr. Rashtuni pointed out, no nation in antiquity had the freedoms and liberties that Israelis had. No one had the notion of no respect of persons, for example, in judicial matters. That's a huge area that the mighty man, the, the powerful man, the rich man, the smart professor was on the same level as the meanest peasant or farmer so far as the law of God was concerned. And there was no provision under God's law that didn't put them as equal before the bar of justice. And that's something that we, we neglect to our, and, and we don't teach it. And apart from the content of biblical law, I think it's also true that we are not prepared because we don't have the character necessary to bring these changes. We are very anxious to point the finger at other people. The pointing of the finger is something that God condemns, I should point out. (laughs) I'm pointing the finger at everyone, myself included, in saying that. But, you know, like Dr. Rashoni would say, people are very intent on having others change, but have no interest in changing themselves. And this is a matter of Christian character, and it's a Christian character matter that is inculcated in the Old Testament more so than the New. And if we neglect the Old Testament, then we're going to have defective character, weak character. Uh, We're going to be spoon-fed instead of being leaders, and that's the key. That's the key is to realize that we are stepping stones to the next generations, and that's where the education must come in. And we must be willing to pay twice, as Americans here. We pay the taxes of regrettably for the system we don't use or shouldn't use anyway. And then we pay for homeschooling or Christian schooling on top of that. That's the price to pay to dig ourselves out of the hole that the lack of character that preceded this era has brought into our laps and and dropped it in our laps. I'd just like to add uh, to what uh, Martin said. Something I've uh, always found to to be very interesting uh, about uh, the apostasy in the Old Testament is that as the people drifted further and further away from God, they never claimed to be apostate. In fact, the whole nature of 
Baalism was that they acknowledged many lords. They thought they were just adding a, a, um, something positive to the worship of Jehovah. So even in the northern kingdom, which was became thoroughly entrenched in Baal worship and devoted to it, never had a single good king. They never actually repudiated Jehovah. Because as far as they were concerned, he was also one of the Balaam. He was one of the lords. He was one of the powers. But they wanted these other things as well. And so they were thought that they were just uh, opening up their theology, opening up their religion to a, a more progressive uh, approach. And when that, after that nation collapsed, Judah did the same thing. And they then became thoroughly entrenched in Baal worship. All the while, the, the temple rites in Jerusalem continued uh, without interruption. So they, they never were self-consciously apostate. And I think that is really representative of a lot what goes on in Western Christianity. They really believe they're still following the way. It's just that they have, they've learned, they think they've learned a few things. And what they've really done is they, they've added things to the word of God that are more important than the word of God and uh, their faith and obedience in, uh, in Jehovah, and his ways. So that term would be syncretism, deciding that we've got biblical faith, but we can add to it to make it better. And one of my favorite passages in the whole of scripture is Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And he's talking to the two disciples who don't know who he is. And it says, using the law and the prophets. So right there, Jesus is elevating what you need to know to understand. And today, because the church by and large doesn't know the law and the prophets, they'll read the book of Revelation as some sort of roadmap as to how to get out of our fix as opposed to understanding the images that the book of Revelation uses that would have origins in the prophets, for example, and people would have understood it differently. So somehow or other, and, and maybe Martin, you can comment on this, we've gotten people to think that the Christian life is the worry-free, you've made it, you know? So they want to make heaven on earth without having God's law be that which reigns. That is the um, message. It's a form of easy believism, among other things. And it means, of course, that we're not counting the cost of following Christ in our day and age. It's that we have a character problem again. Uh, it'd be nice if you could, that's the point of humanism. It says we can do this on our own. We don't need God to create and generate ethics. We can create paradise ourselves. We can do this if you would just vote for us and let us control the uh, all natural resources of the world and the money supply of the world and the banks of the world and the and uh, the human power, manpower of the world. It's always a promise. And it was the same promise that occurred in the garden that the serpent issued a forth. You will be like gods. You can determine what's good and bad for yourself. You won't need God as a reference point. Yeah, of course, that was catastrophic in the extreme. And so the same appeal occurs now. It's a way for what Dr. Rushton called an easy way out. Man looks for an easy way out. He wants to dig out his way out of the problem with a quick fix. Oh, we have a $6 trillion debt. Let's mint a $6 trillion coin and fix it with that and pay the debt off with this one coin. You should tell the treasury to do that. This sleight of hand, of course, does nothing. It still abolishes the value of your currency uh, because it's not gold or silver. It is something that the Constitution says you're not to have, and the Bible says you aren't supposed to inflate. So again, if and it's a form of theft again. When we say we're going to create paradise on earth, it's we want to steal that paradise. We're saying we can get there without using God's law as the mechanism. That means you're going to have to elevate man's law as the means. And when man's law, it always is a disaster. The wrath of man is something that God is uh, uh, it's not useful. The wrath of man cannot pray, is, does not serve the justice of God, doesn't glorify God. It's useless. 
uh, and, and it says the residue of wrath God will restrain in Psalm 7610. The wrath of man shall praise thee, it means God will actually turn it to his purpose and over overturn things. And the residue of wrath, God will restrain. In other words, the things that we do in a trying to defy God and, and, and to spit in his eye, uh, God restrains the results of that. Uh, he's not going to let us go where we think we can go. These are all dead ends because God isn't in them. Uh, as again, as John Owen points out in the passage, there is they won't be protected. They're exposed to every harm and every danger because God is now against them. And as we've said over and over again in these podcasts, according to the proverb, the way of the transgressors is hard. God puts obstacles in the path. There is no way to get to paradise except through God's way. Uh, it is a dead end in every other respect. And man would rather hit his head against that wall forever than to bend the knee to Christ. And of course, the, this rebellion is one that is going to ultimately be quenched. So rather than have a high opinion of to be educated in the law word of God, uh, the West has seemed to put a whole lot more attention on getting your degrees and being validated by men. Mark, do you see us having to self-consciously abandon this model in order to um, see the kind of revival that people say they want? I think we are going to have to think differently in the future. And I think uh, I, it's interesting that even uh, our culture is beginning to say the same thing, that uh, the universities were taken over by the left a long time ago. And for generations now, parents have bought into the proposition that children have to have a college degree, for instance, or they can't get employment. I'm not against a college education uh, when it's necessary, but I think we have so emphasized it, we've basically fed into the secular universities' stranglehold on our culture. And it's very difficult for students going into a secular university to, to hold out against it. So whenever possible, I'd say avoid the university. When it's necessary, I think you, you have to go in and, and uh, go that route. So I, we can't abandon higher education, but my, my father had decided I, he went to university in the 40s, and um, he considered it, uh, uh, even then he, he, he wrote of it, it was a degenerate institution uh, then as he knew it. And it's only gotten worse since then. So yes, our, and our most important education is to understand our faith and applying our faith. And we, le we learn to learn skills for life as we need them. All right. We can also add that universities ostensibly were set up to promote academic freedom. This has been turned on its head in a large, um, in a very destructive way. Academic freedom is actually something that's now been termed a dangerous thing, and it needs to be curtailed. And so that will extend into, uh, if allowed, will extend into the culture at large if it's not rejected wholesale. But you cannot fight something with nothing, and the academicians know this, that they are the gatekeepers for what is accepted. So unless you raise a alternate independent standard, and that's what I think Christian Reconstruction is proposing with alternate independent mechanisms for education, homeschooling, Christian schooling, creating institutions that are not dependent on status models, that do have something closer to academic freedom by far, because we study them as much, but they don't want to hear from us. See, that's the irony of it, is that uh, we're very much aware of what the ideas are floating. Nobody knew the position of the humanist better than Dr. Rushtuni did. So he's fully aware where those, those paths lead. But one thing they don't honestly believe in is academic freedom. And that's become almost a point of notoriety. There's a Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, FIRE, F-I-R-E, Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. And they go after all these universities and sue them for all the restrictions of freedom that happen on campuses. 
uh, that you have to have a separate organization even doing this is indicative that academic freedom is under fire. Uh, and we know this today because certain things are not allowed to be said. You don't have the academic freedom to discuss uh, biological results uh, in the medical field at this point. This was true when we first published uh, in Chalcedon around 2015, an article that showed that um, the side effects of methadone, that the journals, the medical journals that published that actually uh, find it very controversial and fear that those articles are going to be shut down. It's just stunning that this happens, and it happens not only in medicine, but also happens in every field. There's no neutral field, and the reason there's no neutral field that isn't affected is because man's sin is very extensive and, and extends into every domain that man in his mind and his heart, darkened heart try to investigate because he, it colors his thinking. It's what Van Til says is the special glasses that the humanist is wearing, especially when he's thinking. He used the example of the carpenter whose bus saw had been changed, the bevel element had been changed by his son. And he didn't realize that instead of cutting 90 degrees boards, it was cutting 85 degree boards. So all the boards that he was sawing were wrong. And that's the way it is with all humanistic thought. You know, we are made in God's image. And when we attempt to do things humanistically, every thought that we think is like a board that we saw with a bad blade that's offset improperly. The noetic effects of sin affect everything. And since they're becoming more blatant, there is an attack on academic freedom because it would become too obvious that humanism is imploding in terms of its principles. It cannot make good on its principles. It ends up uh, a, a soup of nonsense, ultimately, uh, and because it's riddled with internal contradictions because it is put and built on a foundation that cannot stand. It is shifting sand. Regarding, uh, Martin mentioned academic freedom. Well, um, even in Christian in institutions, institutions tend to think institutionally and they promote the institution. And uh, another problem my, my father often pointed out, one of his criticisms of seminaries, which have the best, sometimes have the best uh, of intentions, is the, the process of getting advanced seminary degree is they want a prospective student to do original biblical research. And so he said the product was that a lot of what was coming out of the seminaries were students who were geared to speculation and oddball theories that were deviating from orthodoxy in the name of Christian scholarship. And he said, that's the, the, the seminary has taken them in a, a false direction because instead of de emphasizing the importance of fidelity to scripture, faithfulness to scripture, they were trying to emphasize, do something new, come up with a new idea about scripture if you want an advanced degree. And so it's not enough to be a Christian institution. We have to focus on what advances the kingdom of God. Is it doing something new, something different, something that will make our institutional set apart from all others, or is it being faithful to the work of the kingdom? So I just finished watching a documentary that talks about um, evangelical seminaries and how compromised they have become and have started promoting things like critical race theory and intersectionality. And if you don't understand those terms, good luck, because I'm not sure that these are not definitions that flow with the tide, depending on what somebody wants to say. But it seems to me that if the congregation doesn't know the scripture, then they don't have a way to evaluate what they're hearing from the pulpit. And one of the things, Mark, that I always found wonderful and unique about your father's preaching is that at the end of every sermon, he'd say, does anybody have any questions? And he was willing to say, okay, I must have said something that you bring up a question for. I don't know too many people who would want to do that today, but I think it would make for a much more of an educated congregation, don't you think, to be able to say, no, sir, that's not exactly what the scripture says. Right. Well, that was the model of the... Uh... Uh, done in the Sanhedrin, you'd have a lesson 
but the lesson itself was often a, an interchange and drawing out the student to get them to, to think. And uh, questions were very much a part of that. And we see a number of the instances in the ministry uh, of Jesus where he had exchanges with individuals. Sometimes they were more or less hostile, but that was considered appropriate in a teaching situation is to ask questions uh, of the master. So many times when I've been at churches that have Bible studies and we're going to talk about the pastor's sermon. The questions go something like, what did you like about it? Where was he right? And there was never any um, breath of opportunity to say, well, I actually disagreed with that point because I think that's actually contrary to scripture that was shut down pretty quickly. Well, that uh, Dr. Rush Juni made a distinction between good questions and, and bad questions. And he was uh, commenting on 1 Timothy 1.4. I just looked it up here. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which uh, is in faith. So do. So he said that we should not be involved in things that minister questions. In other words, just generate more and more questions and we just expand our uncertainty about something, but rather that edify and truly build up. So he was willing to take all the questions that would build up. But if he detected that something was in the category of 1 Timothy 1 4, he would point that out gently to the questioner that it was a question that does not actually deserve an answer insofar as it leads away from the truth as opposed to centering us and founding us on the certainty of the faith once delivered. So I think we're pretty much all agreed to the fact that it's a responsibility of everybody to know what the word of God said. And if we're going to fulfill our role as priests under God, doesn't mean we have to work officially in a ministerial you know job description at a church or or something like that that every place that we go we're ambassadors for Christ and if we can't relate what's happening today in terms of the full counsel of God then we're going to be like those people who read the newspapers today and try to take what's happening in the newspaper and shove it in and give a false meaning to certain parts of scripture and, and regarding understanding uh, the word, uh, there's a, uh, Paul makes reference in 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And uh, something my father brought out in a position paper back from the late 80s is that that's very much a part of the, the Nicene Creed. It says, and I believe in the Holy Ghost the Lord and giver of life who proceedeth from the father and the son who with the father and the son together is worshiped and glorified who spake by the prophets. So we stand in terms of the written word, the revelation of God and the power of his spirit to make good on that in us and in the, 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 the world. And so th this is a important and so our, our liberty is in terms of this context about what we believe about God, where we are as, as you know, covenant children of God and serving his kingdom. And it, it, it's an all-enveloping context for our life and thought. And so our freedom is really in, in serving in God, and that entails our understanding that larger context. because. Otherwise, if we aren't doing that self-consciously, then what we will fall back into is the realm of sin, and we'll think in terms of sinful man, and we'll think of freedom and liberty and our needs in terms of this lawlessness rather than the, the law of liberty in terms of the work of the Spirit and our submission to God and His Word. Right. And Dr. Restoni, in that same position paper, basically renders that text to mean where the spirit of the Lord is, there alone is liberty. Uh, it, and he repeats this thought in his commentary on First and Second Corinthians uh, pending, already at the printers uh, that's coming out, because where the spirit of God is cast out, there is slavery. There's only enslavement and tyranny. So with the spirit of God being present and honored, and respected and obeyed, uh, 
it's a very, very different story. Then the, the foundations, the preconditions of liberty will exist and it will dominate the situation. But when humanism throws out and, and uh, blasphemes the spirit of God, essentially, then there cannot be any liberty except in name only. So we'll create new liberties, and I think that's the whole emphasis. We'll create liberties for sin and call that liberty, but liberty for Christian faith, which actually will protect a nation, and by creating the defense we talked about from Isaiah 4 or 5 over it, that's going to be decried and uh, denounced. So Christians need to be educated in their obligations to their king. What part does our king and our kingdom, this kingdom that is intrinsic and built in, and expanding and transforming the world, what part do we play in it? How equipped are we? We are in a situation where we are often workmen ashamed as opposed to workmen approved. And I think that has to change because God will simply use another generation and leave us in the lurch. And I think that would be a catastrophe to be laid at our door if we were like that. We should take note of the things that happened in the past. First Corinthians 10 tells us, The things that happened to Israel were in samples unto us. Do you want to grumble in the wilderness like we've been doing? Then the outcome is going to be very, very poor. But if you want to embrace the promises of God and walk faithfully with courage, then liberty will be our portion. So if anybody's thinking, okay, this sounds good. What do I do? Where do I go? Well, a lot of our listeners have already taken a dive into the Institutes of Biblical Law. And so they're pretty well familiar with that. Well, I would highly recommend that you get a hold of that three-volume set on Dr. Rushduni's position papers, where a lot of this discussion tonight comes from a section in volume three of An Informed Faith that really puts together what he had to say about liberty. But to go one step further, Dr. Rush Dooney gave a layman's version of a systematic theology that would equip the average person to take the faith, put legs to it in every area of life and thought. So it's not like we don't have a way to do this. We do have a way to do this. And maybe um, Mark and Martin, you give your closing thoughts on this. There's an education to be had, and that's one of the reasons Calcedon exists. Well, I'd just say you're right, and in, in the, the, the easiest way to get a great higher education is to read, because there's always people who have delved into something far deeper than you are and who can express it far deeper than, than you can to help your understanding. So there's, there's a wealth of information today. We, we don't have difficulty getting good books even with many books, good books now are, are are available digitally for, you know, very low cost. And so, and many are free online. So there's very little express reason for us not to get a good education and uh, quality education. It's, it's before us like, and available to us like never before in human history. And so there's no excuse and we don't have to pay tens of thousands of dollars to get a good education. Or get into debt in order to do it. My final thought would be this. It's better to grasp a small section of scripture because what you understand, you can apply. Better five words that are understood than a thousand that aren't. So people who read through the entire Bible and don't understand a, a whit of it are not doing themselves any favor. It might be an interesting spiritual exercise, not too far removed from a rosary for a Roman Catholic, I'm afraid. But if you read and apply it, if you understand it, That's the key, you see, and that's what we often miss, uh, depth. We have a shallow faith because we know a lot of things a little bit, as opposed to digging into something deeper uh, and in terms of application. I think that's the whole point. If the faith is not applied, then it's a mental exercise only. But it's world transforming. This word of God that has been given to us is to guide us into how we are to walk, how we are to obey, how we are to run our businesses, our vocations, our lives, our families, our nations, how the world is to run. It's indicated here. And if we don't understand it, we're not going to be able to apply it. So that's the first key. Uh, and as we get this picture in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, where they said the, the purpose was to read from the law and then to make the meaning clear to the people so that they might obey it. 
So if we're not making the meaning clear, we're missing the mark in some way, shape, or form. This is so important. It's in Habakkuk. There's an interesting point where the Lord told the prophet, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. In other words, the letter should be so big that someone running by the billboard can read it. And uh, so we need to make our message that plain and easily readable. Dr. Rushton, he did that because he was bite-sized pieces of scripture. You take a small section, he would not spend more than 20, 25 minutes on it max because he wanted to extract what was important that we could be applied to our lives. And so if we're not implying, we're not actually walking in the faith. We are simply going through a mental exercise, and that's not going to transform the world. It's going to take Christians obeying the faith once delivered to the faith. So that's where we are. We have to be in terms, working in terms of understanding the word of God. And this comes from reading it, good commentaries, good sermons, good scholarship. We have 21 centuries of decent scholarship to appeal to. Don't, don't reinvent the wheel is my advice. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's, it's there for us. We've just been neglecting it for two or three centuries, and that's on us. It doesn't have to be reinvented. It just has to be dug back in. Warfield said, we've been deprived of the strong discipline of the past. It's time to recover that vision. I think that's a good place to conclude. Um, we hope that uh, you'll explore some of the things we talked about, and we look forward to talking with you next time.